so I'm Seth Priestman. I'm an archaeologist, and um, my affiliation is um, I have an honorary research fellowship at, um, in the Department of Archaeology, Durham University. And um, my work is um, well. It'd be nice to summarize it kind of simply if I could, but it's 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 very varied, really. I have. Um, I suppose I'm juggling various different kind of freelance contracts, um, working for kind of governmental agencies in right. mostly in the Arab world at the moment. Um, and then also have some um, of my own kind of research budgets for, for, for my own research that I'm pursuing. Right. Um, again, mostly in the Arab world at the moment. Um, so yeah, kind of a whole, whole variety of things I'm, I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I was trying to, I was just before this interview, I was sort of thinking actually like how many different projects I've got. And I, I think I've probably got about 10 or 10 wow. or 15 different projects at the moment wow. on the go kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's kind of almost too, too many probably, but, um, no. <laughs> um, it's interesting anyway, to work across a, a range of different fields. It must be quite fun as well to to have different projects ongoing and must be quite dynamic for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's dynamic. And um, I suppose one thing I've been sort of trying the last few years, you know, all of us when we kind of finish the PhD and then what happens next and, yeah. um, you know, there are different kind of routes in academia and mm. and some are very settled, obviously, if you can have a lectureship in university or something like mm. that. but. I suppose what I've been trying the last few years is to see if it's possible to kind of work almost in a kind of freelance capacity mm. across different research projects. And yeah, so far that seems to be going going quite well as a as a route. Um, That's quite nice to know, actually, because I mean, I'm at this point where I'm just finishing my PhD, and the I only I feel that the only option for me is to be in a lecture position or a research position or a postdoc, whatever. And it's really hard, but you seem to have found the ideal where you can almost pick and choose the projects you want to be involved in. And it's nice to have that freedom. That's actually quite reassuring. So thanks for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for you know telling us that it's possible to 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 think more creatively about a career in academia. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it depends what sort of field you're in specifically. But I mean, I have my own kind of research um, specialization mm -hmm. in, in ceramics, especially, which mm -hmm means mm. there's a lot of kind of work that needs doing for field work projects but mm. but then there are also a lot of projects going on in the Middle East at the moment mm. in terms of developing um, museum new museum displays and mm. um, visitor attraction schemes and, and things that need kind of expert input right. from the side of heritage and, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of where where I can work with these different governmental agencies who are setting up these things. Mm. Um, I've just nice. thought, yeah, maybe one sort of example, maybe just to kind of to, to yes, please to out of that to kind of get to explain what I'm saying. So one of the projects I'm doing that's probably one of the bigger ones is is this project in eastern Saudi Arabia at the site of Fudge, and um, Fudge is this amazing site. It's this huge um, walled city that was founded around the fourth century BC. Um, it's a 40 hectare city. It's about the size of 50 football pitches together, if you think of it that kind of size. Wow. With this huge um, fortification wall. Yeah, it's huge and it has this fortification wall around it. Um, and it seems to have been founded on this sort of important trade route that was really bringing up, um, it was aromatics that were coming up overland from South Arabia into the Gulf. And these were, you know, incredibly sort of valuable commodity at that time. And Fadj was sitting on this ex in exchange route, kind of controlling that trade as the material went off up towards Mesopotamia and the main markets were in Mesopotamia and then on into the Mediterranean. So that area of sort of Northeast Arabia became a kind of semi-autonomous kingdom um, at that time with Fadj as its capital. Um, and the, yeah, so the site is, is, is kind of, amazingly important historically and um, the project itself is a uh, it's run by the CNRS who are the the, um, the 
Center of Scientific Research in, in, in France. Um, and also the Saudi um, Commission for Tourism and National Heritage of the kind of governmental organization. Um, so it's a collaboration between them, but then the project itself is, is financed from, from French academic sources and from private sources. And then my role within that project is as the ceramic specialist and it's a, where you have a five-year research project and a huge amount of material coming from that excavation. And um, so my job within that is to kind of go through all of this, this material that's coming and, and record it and work towards the publication. And so, yeah, that's the kind of, you know, example of, of how these things right. are configured. No, that's quite, ex that's very exciting. And so many different players, governments, uh, organizations, uh, academics. It's quite yeah, it's quite complex, actually. Very complex. And start to break it down and, and look yeah. at all the ingredients. And um, oh, there's also a role for commercial archaeology in there. So, you know, a lot of the excavation is being done by a private company from France who, who specialize in excavation and, and do very, right. very high quality right. um, excavations in the Middle East. So. Right. So that's another whole sort of channel into the project as well. Oh, that's fascinating. And is the end goal to have, uh, you mentioned a publication, but would there be a museum as, as well, um, like a physical yeah. space? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's one of, that's one of the big reasons why um, the Saudi authorities are so supportive of the project, because they're, they're really keen to develop tourism. Sure, and, and it's right. Such, um, dramatic and important yeah. site that mm -hmm. you know, it's hardly received any attention up until no. now. Mm -hmm. So the plan is to yeah to make it um, much more kind of open for visitors and yeah. Um, yeah I suppose another thing to say about that site is it's it's it's, it's quite sort of romantic in a way. It's 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 just um it's all buried sure. the sand. It's this sort of amazing old walled city but it's buried completely. So you go there and you can't really see you can see hardly any of it now. But when you dig in, you find these walls that are still standing to three and a half meters high. Um, oh, that's incredible. That sounds beautiful. So in terms, in trying to make it attractive for visitors, part of mm. that is open up these walls and, and mm. preserve them so that they wouldn't mm. fall apart. And so people could actually see what was there. Mm. That's very exciting. Mm. And and do you, um, is a part of your project looking at uh, the Iranian con uh, area as well? I was about to say continent, but that's not right. <laughs> the Iranian yeah. lands as well, or the Persian yeah. lands? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, um, Iran is a kind of, yeah, is a real central focus of my research and, and right. has been throughout. Um, so it'd be good to talk about that as, as yeah, part of just, it. I know, just curious, uh, what exactly, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not an archaeologist and have zero knowledge, so the, the questions are going to be quite basic, but um, what part of Iran interests you? I assume you're still doing ceramics as well, or are you interested in other things as an archaeologist? Um, yeah, I suppose the a big sort of theme of my research is, um, is about uh, maritime trade in, in the Persian Gulf and the Indian mm. And I've been looking at that for um, the past two decades now. Wow. With a strong focus on, um, well, for the Persian Gulf, that whole region is kind of dominated politically and economically by major cities that were, were distributed along the Iranian coast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they, they moved through time. So sure. early on, in the Sasanian period, in the kind of late antique Sasanian period, there's a huge port at Bushir, um, which is also now kind of a politically important place where the, the, there's the nuclear power station and, and so on. But right, before, um, in the past, it was this um, important kind of coastal town in the Sasanian period. Right, okay. And okay, then okay. later on, that's taken over by Saraf, which was, it's also a yeah, very famous um, port of the early Islamic period. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then later on, it moves down to to, to Kish Island and then Hormuz eventually. So, right. so this ah. is a long history of about mm. two thousand years of, of of kind of moving from one port to the next. And mm. um, I'm really interested in, in in working around those. Mm. 
And and what led you to pursue this this line of studies uh, to focus on the, the the Middle East? Yeah, it's kind of. If thing. I may ask. <laughs> I thought you might ask that and um mm -hmm. yeah there's a quite a lot one could say like mm -hmm. um, how to even answer that question I mean I suppose there's a sort of I was thinking there's a sort of academic answer to that and there's maybe a more kind of emotional answer to that that's but, nice um, <laughs> I mean it's, yeah. it's always a bit there's always a bit of both isn't it I mean it's always a bit of both they're mixed up and and it's quite convoluted I suppose so yeah, the academic part really is, um, well, I've always been interested in pottery. It's been a kind of big, um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a very kind of rural part of, of Scotland, um, mm. kind of deep in the countryside. And my mm. parents had a little farm. We grew up on a farm and my parents nice. ran a pottery. So my mother ah. and my brother were both potters. And right. so I sort of grew, ah. up, <laughs> grew nice. up like that kind of going on all the time ah, as, as sure. sort of my experience growing up mm -hmm. I suppose as a kid I kind of almost had an ambition to become a, a potter myself and it's always been a bit in my mind that that's right what I do. can, can you then, can you can you do that can you actually make um uh, ceramics yourself I mean I can to, but not to, to, to a brilliant level and, and when I see that's it that's incredible though that's so nice that you can <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, know, I feel of it. really call myself a potter. I see people who dedicate their life to that, and that's what mm. I call potters. But um, I kind of went into academia and, and as, well, I went into archaeology. I wanted to study that. And as soon as I started studying archaeology, I could see ceramics was something I really understood and, and could identify with and, and kind of being a, a bit of a different perspective to than, mm -hmm. than maybe mm. other people. A lot of Definitely. people approaching it purely academically and, and I mm -hmm. had this kind of connection. So oh, that's so nice. Hmm. So I, I had a plan when I was doing undergraduate, I wanted to study kind of Neolithic, Scottish Neolithic archaeology was my, oh. my plan. <laughs> it's quite far the way you've come from. <laughs> far away from that, but um, I was really keen on that. And then when I finished my degree, this opportunity came up, a kind of job mm. opportunity came up to, mm. to work on medieval Persian ceramics and I you know see. I knew nothing about oh, it uh, right. the time. and it was a bit daunting really like to go from Scottish Neolithic to this other material but mm. I kind of thought about it and and I thought you know I wanted to know about the kind of great ceramic cultures of the world and and, and they are really um, you know Chinese pottery Islamic pottery of, of, of the Middle East is, is another one that's kind of right up there in terms of, sort of world cult, um, leading ceramic cultures. So yeah, I thought it was really interesting just to, to look at it from that perspective. Um, so I started to work on this material and I remember at the beginning it was really really challenging to kind of understand this whole historical world from the Middle East. It's so complicated and in a way, I kind of almost love prehistory because, like, there's nothing written down, and no, nobody really knows what happened. So you can kind of use your imagination to work out what was. Yeah, going. But, that's more fun but, in a way, isn't it? <laughs> in the Middle East, you can't get away with it. You can't just make it up yourself. It's, it's, um, you know, there's fully formed legal systems and economic systems and and complex, very very complex societies which you have to try and understand and. So at the beginning, I found it quite bewildering, but as time went on, you know, you start to learn and, and it becomes more and more interesting. And I think, yeah, the more you learn, the more you want to go into it. And, and, and it, that's kind of almost never ending, really. So, yeah. Of course, of course. Mm. But that's very um that's that's uh, that's nice it's nice that you've sort of it, it's i think it's incredible that you've come from you know bringing your own personal experience and your own personal background and then pursuing a whole different field but sort of found finding roots and links between the two yeah and that's really really nice and um yeah, I think that's very, it's very nice. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm Malaysian, I work on Iran, and I feel like I've come very far, but there are actually so many links and um, common ground that, I don't know, I also feel very at home here. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Yeah, I think I think I mean I suppose it's true of any academic subject. Mm, if you, sure. If you, if the more you learn, the more it kind of starts to open up and become interesting. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Um, yeah, you've talked a little bit about what you're working on with with the project um, in in eastern Saudi Arabia. Is there? Uh, and you also mentioned that you're doing many projects at the same time. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the other things that you're doing. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's one project that I'm uh, that I'm working on like right now, um, which is uh, my first book is just about to be published, which. Um, really excited about it's been like uh, many congratulations years. thank you so much yeah it's been many many years in the making so it's really exciting to see it mm -hmm. come together and it's a sort of culmination of like pretty much everything I've done in the last 20 years it feels like um so it's kind of starts off you know it has all the material from the first project that I did that I was just mentioning this one mm -hmm. with the the medieval pottery from from Iran, which is a big survey, um, surface survey collection from along the coast. And then I also after that, I spent quite a few years working at the British Museum um, as a project curator there on the finds from Saraf from the medieval port of Saraf. Mm -hmm. And that's another big sort of ongoing piece of work, which um, Great. Exciting. Will, will be published and has led on to various other things. Mm -hmm. And then off the back of that, I did my PhD, which was a kind of, I wanted to look at, um, I wanted to look at like ceramic trade in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that hadn't really been done up until now um, is to take a quantitative approach to the material. And so a lot of people had kind of looked, you know, documented the fact that you find all this pottery moving around huge distances. So, so in southern Iran, for example, you find Chinese pottery or pottery from India or Africa or many places. And that had been kind of set out. But what's quite interesting is to try to see, you know, over this long time period, how did, tra how did trade evolve? How did it change? And, and there are lots of ideas about particular periods where there were boom periods of trade or, or periods of recession. And a lot of that's based on a quite kind of anec anecdotal foundation, essentially. Mm. It's very hard to say, like, how much trade was happening at this time in the ancient past and, and did it change? And so pottery, in a way, provides you with this one sort of key that it's one of the materials that was commonly traded commonly broken and, and doesn't disappear archaeologically. Like everything else that you want to study, like carpets or textiles or spices, or all the things that were really dry, probably driving this trade, mm -hmm. they all disappear archaeologically. True. The pottery is the one thing that just always stays there. That's true. Yeah. And so you can count mm -hmm. it. You can just very, very simply, you can count it by layer mm -hmm. within a pipe, look at how it changes, how the proportions mm -hmm. change. Mm. that to map you know long-term change in in, in, mm. in individual trade so, mm. so that's what I did I um, brought together all of the data that is available which mm. is uh, currently around four and a half million pieces of pottery wow <laughs> <laughs> that's an incredible amount yeah it's an incredible amount I mean it's kind of boosted a lot by one one excavation in India which has produced a vast vast amount but Anyway, right. <laughs> anyway, that aside, um, mm. yeah, it's a lot of material. And, but the, the thing is that this approach is only really kind of catching on now. Mm. So 10, 15 years ago, there was hardly any information. And oh. now people are recording the material in enough detail to do this. And mm. as we move forward, there's going to be more and more sites coming in the next 15, 20 years. Sure. Totally different situation. But the book is a sort of attempt to bring together what we have so far and to Amazing. start to analyze this um, question. Mm. Mm. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing, uh, to seeing the book and, and maybe we can do another interview about the book perhaps yeah, 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 <laughs> to promote that. that. Yeah, yeah, why not? No, that's amazing. And it's nice because it sounds like you've you've been on this journey in, uh, of how academia has changed and uh, how our approach has changed as well. So that's very exciting. Yeah, no, I can see it, the field changing so mm. so quickly before my eyes. And, oh, wow. Uh, 
in a way, you know, in a way, it's linked to a kind of political situation. And, right. um, you know, there were a lot of people working in Iran, foreign, you know, people from, from Europe working in Iran in the 60s and 70s. Um, and then in the kind of mid 70s, as the um, Iranian revolution approached, things changed and, and, and that whole kind of field of research shut down in a way for foreign participation and a lot of people moved out to working in Iraq and other countries around. So in a way Iranian the scholarship around kind of the, the um, archaeology of Iran started to kind of dry up I suppose in the 90s and, and, and as people were retiring and kind of moving out of that field and so there was a kind of opportunity at that time to move into this area. There wasn't really anybody working on it, um, at least within kind of Western institutions. Of course, within Iran, there's a constant, you know, there's a constant field of, 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 of local archaeology that has always been going on and continues. Um, and then for myself, yeah, I've had opportunities to work in Iran at various times, and I, I, I've been so fortunate with that and I so you know they've been amazing those opportunities I've had to do field work and, and surveys along the coast um, and I love working there you know I kind of wish I could work there all the time really oh <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it's difficult with the you know mm. there are politics and, and mm. things that make it difficult to work there all the time mm. so in the early 2000s sort of um yeah, the early 2000s, I, I did a lot of work in different parts of Iran. Mm -hmm. And then since 2009, I haven't had any access to there. So oh, that's, uh... in a way, all my work since then has been a kind of a bit like almost circling around Iran. So working in mm -hmm. the Caucasus in, in Georgia, mm -hmm. Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. um, working in, um, in the Arabian Peninsula, mm -hmm. Iran, mm -hmm. UAE, Saudi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Always kind of looking back to to, to what's coming from the, the you know greater Iran and the mm. Iranian. Of course, no, but that's uh, no. Thank you, and I suppose um, where do, where do you see the future for archaeology in Iran, or rather on Iran? Yeah, I think there's. Where do I see the future? I mean, I mean, one of the things that's amazing whenever I have gone there is just. Mm -hmm. The, the amount and, and richness of the archaeology that is in Iran is absolutely mm -hmm. staggering. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. even you see the new finds that are coming up and every time it surprises you, something absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's oh, that's nice. And wow. So the amount of material there to be documented is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the future, I think there's a, there's a huge kind of, I suppose things are changing, you know, we're in a kind of changing academic landscape and, and many things are happening, but mm. in my mind, I see a huge, huge opportunity for Iranian archaeologists, mm -hmm. um, which of course they're, they're seizing already, but there's a kind of, I suppose there are two strands to that, there's a kind of internal archaeology of Iran within the, the Persian speaking mm -hmm. community. Um, which is obviously crucial and, and very vibrant, but there's mm -hmm. also a kind of international, a global interest in, in the history and archaeology of Iran. And so for those Iranian mm -hmm. archaeologists who, who kind of reach out and engage with the international community and work in collaboration, mm -hmm. I can see really big opportunities for, for those scholars. Then um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the future as far as I can see is the kind of partnership. Mm -hmm and collaborations that, mm. that go across the globe and don't even necessarily have to involve people going there physically. There are so many things you can do now in terms mm. of communicating over the internet and so on. That's true. Technologies mm. that you can share. Yeah. I find that really exciting actually. Um, yeah. mm. And I suppose that's what I'm pursuing already is, is kind mm. of different contacts with different um, archaeologists working in Iran already. Mm. No, uh, that's exciting. And I suppose that's what <laughs> this pandemic has also taught us is that it's very possible to keep, you know, academia alive, you know, and, sh and finding new ways to communicate and share information. So, yeah, in a way. Yeah, and no, I think there are kind of, there are probably, probably totally new ways of sort of conceiving mm. academia as well from, from mm. 
the bottom up that maybe we haven't even really thought of yet. Mm, that's true. Um, yeah. But um, and and I mean, it's 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 been really interesting um, hearing about your research and your um, your journey as well. So thank you so much for sharing. And perhaps as a last question, I was wondering if you could, you know, what would your advice be for someone who wanted to pursue um, archaeology of the Persian world, let's say, um, today? Um, if someone's just starting out. Yeah, they're just starting out. Um, I think my advice, I mean, it would be almost the same, not necessarily even just for the Persian world, but for, for mm -hmm. almost any sort of archaeological, mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. going into archaeology. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to have a, um, something that you can, a specialism that mm -hmm. you can really kind of focus on. Mm -hmm. And it's become a little bit unpopular, actually, these days. Oh, I, think, really. mm -hmm. I think a lot of research is more general and mm -hmm. theoretical. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, that's really interesting and useful mm. when you're, you're training in archaeology or history mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. about the kind of broad theoretical framework. Of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you have mm -hmm. some particular skill that can be applied, mm -hmm. then I think that's going to take you a long way in whatever mm -hmm. you do. That could be mm -hmm. using geographic information systems or, right. or mm -hmm. modeling, or it could be working on some particular type of artifact. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. Whatever it is, it could be a technological skill or, or, or a thematic skill. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. For me, that's that's what's kind of taken me forward in archaeology is working mm. on on ceramics, mm -hmm. yeah. having that specialization. Yeah, yeah. that and makes a lot of sense. Me, I, you know, I mean, I love pottery anyway. I told you why I got mm -hmm. a connection to it, but mm. in an academic sense, I don't really want to study pottery just because it's a nice thing. I for me, yeah. it's all vehicle to, to explore yeah. something bigger mm, um, to tell a human story i suppose yeah story, exactly yeah that's yeah. incredible uh, thank you so much um dr priestman for talking to me i really appreciate uh you sharing your rich expertise and your rich experience so thank you very very much great no thank you so much for inviting me here really appreciate it <laughs>